Okay, so you gotta start somewhere. <laughs> so, so you might say that uh, the past is something we can learn from, and and the present is something to live, and the future is something to love. If we want to move forward healthily, I mean, you could say a whole lot of other things as well, of course. Um, and there's something that can happen when someone's in the process of trying to learn from the past that prevents them from doing so mm. we we get sort of we get sort of locked you know uh -huh. yeah i think you are a man who may be able to talk to that in a in a rather interesting way i think that there's been a way where well i'll certainly try to <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> better still now mate it's it's all fucking bollocks from here well um i think that the blocks that we have to learning from our mistakes they're a lot about um you know self-criticism and self-hatred and perfectionism and the or there's something that Im will make people realize an emotional uh, aspect of it that there needs to be uh, a change or that there needs to be a new truth uh, there's something about growth that needs to happen that's postponed or resisted that I, I was a master of resistance mm. <laughs> from my early LSD trips and had very very difficult LSD, LSD trips and mm -hmm. would just hold on and wouldn't let go and wouldn't learn and just wasn't capable of it and I had a series of trips my first year of college, which eventually led me to, you know, go to the guidance counselor and learn about Stan Groff was to um, just take it, to try to have whatever I heard about this mystical unit of experience. I wanted to know the truth. I wanted to mm -hmm. have a different understanding. I want to get out of being confused. And um, I would have these very strong trips. A lot of stuff would happen. I'd have these different emotions, but then I would, I'd still be like, I, you know, and I would have a difficult time um, letting things happen. I would end up resisting, and I would feel just incredible friction of my brain, and that it was mm -hmm. me doing it. And that, it was fear. It was, it was um, for me. It was like even the emotional circuits. I wasn't prepared. I didn't have the capacity. These were strong emotions, and I hadn't built up even my capacity to right. like, what like do you a do? lightning rod. Or what do you do? And so, I think the um, there's a lot of different ways that people get blocked, and there are some ways that we're learning about how to unblock if people are willing to do it. And it's not just about the drug. I think it's very important to say that it's drug MDMA. assisted or other drugs, but it's MDMA assisted psychotherapy for yeah. PTSD. Um, but there's a voluntary part where the people are ultimately healing themselves and they have to choose to do so and choose to face things. And, and so, has to be voluntary right very some important thing it has to come from the individual yeah so we have a not i mean a very just to give you an example we don't ever hand mdma to somebody right you know we put it down and they have to take it themselves from right. the very start and so it's um their own inner wisdom that we're helping them with and they have to make these decisions and come to feel certain things and um and so once people recognize that too that it's not so automatic take a pill and something happens that you have to make it happen and own it um, people can find less punitive um, ways to relate to self-criticism or they can be more self-loving and forgiving and just have a kind of relaxation I mean this Rabbi Zalman Shakhtar described MDMA as a delight like the Sabbath right you know a relax yeah that's very very interesting I mean there's something about the relationship to light mm. that mm. so I mean with respect to motivation it's something in front of you you know it's something to move towards right but it's all but it's also something that that well yes I mean imagine if you're in a cave and, and it's uh, okay. it, it's yeah, it's yeah, morning yeah, you need to yeah. go out there into the day yeah. right I mean it's also a, you know a mythological motif you yeah. know that the sun being consciousness consciousness and, and things like this it, it is a, it's a primal thing and, and I think sometimes in in a certain mystical yeah. experiences you can have there is also the movement towards something you know mm. sometimes but 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 more generally it's important to set goals you know and mm. 
and uh, there's an interesting idea. <laughs> yeah, Eisenhower, the general Eisenhower mm. being president, he has a saying that uh, planning is everything, plans are nothing. Mm. You know, have you have to set mm-hmm. your goals, but there's so many, you know, plans that you make that keep getting um, thwarted by reality or change. No, and, absolutely. <laughs> and absolutely. But the thing is, you have to make the plans in order yeah, to then yeah, yeah. judge whether or not things are cohering with them. Exactly, right? exactly. And the thing is, where yeah. does that where does the ability yeah. to set those goals come from? Now, I actually think I actually think, Rick, that it comes from a place that blurs the line between the psychological and the metaphysical. Mm. If you take certain things into account. Um, I, I, I th- well, I feel that the um, impetus for me to study psychedelics comes from multiple generations behind me who were killed killed in the Holocaust and in other ways. So that if that's what you mean, that the goal comes from life that happened before I was even born. Yeah. Well, well, I mean that makes a lot of sense, right? I mean we are we are creatures with a history. We've yeah, evolved over yeah. a very long time, and and yeah. you might think that what also moves other beings forward into life is is in some sense the same essence that gives us that capacity as well. Now in our lives right now, we can use many other words to talk about things that are meaningful and things to do, but but there is something I think uh, really essential about this this sort of a will to movement or a will yeah. to life. It's philosophical ideas, but you know. In order to, in order to set goals, sometimes I feel you have to you have to figure out where you are and also where you've been. Mm-hmm. And I guess with MDMA, we well, how would you describe the experience of MDMA mm. Uh, mm. in in that way that allows you to uh, not only just accept what you are now, but to what to to deal with the past how do you even yeah here's a okay um there's a mdma is like a deep breath and it helps you to think clearly to the ways in which our fears block our thinking we don't want to think certain things you know look at we don't want to think that the ice can actually be melting and we could be changing the climate of the earth you know and so we have people that reject it with climate change denial and Mm -hmm. you know how can they how how is that this is the earth cooling by the way this is (laughs) oh great can you come out we're out in the back Rick, that news better have been extremely important. <laughs> Rita is showing up. <laughs> so then, I guess, I guess uh, MDMA as a deep breath. Yeah, and that by helping calm the emotions, you can think more clearly. So one of the veterans that was in our study was long PTSD after friends were killed and wounded in Iraq. Mm -hmm. And he described the healing from um, a medium dose of 75 milligrams with this idea that he he came to the realization that the PTSD was his way of staying connected with his friends who'd been killed. Mm -hmm. And this was a sign of loyalty. Mm -hmm. This was, um, it wasn't, but then he looked at it from their point of view. And he said, these people are dead. They wouldn't want me to suffer. They can't live. They would want me to live for them. And he said, now, what am I going to do with the rest of my life? And in that moment, he healed himself from PTSD. Mm. And there was just this... (laughs) Sorry. That's okay. Well, thank God we're not trying to save the world, hey? Okay, because... We keep uh, well, on. We are. We are. But, uh, <laughs> but we don't way. have to do it all ourselves. That's for sure. Jesus Christ. Well, I don't think anyone could. But at the same <laughs> no, time, no, <laughs> there's this is this strange thing that every individual is an individual, and they're responsible for themselves. You know, and so in that sense, there is that ultimate responsibility, right? Yeah, that's very scary, actually. And but it's about finding your point of leverage. Like, yeah, who are you? Knowing your past, as you're saying, knowing what's the current situation, and where can you? make a, a contribution that's you know uses your abilities and what the world needs in some kind of pattern and yes um 
you know, there was something about how um, I thought a lot of people would actually see psychedelics as a solution. Mm. Um, and, you know, uh, eventually it's turned out that way. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Well, they certainly can be. They can be remarkable solutions for an, and for lots of people with with and about problems that are so fundamental and and uh, important to all of us, which is really quite interesting. And I, I I think the title Beyond Psychedelics I've come to understand it's about um, you know what do we do with them? Absolutely. How do they help us move beyond those moments into our integration into our daily life into our choices in the world? Yes, absolutely. I think that's a great intention as a message and the thing is of course the experience you have on psychedelics is at least in big part a product of the life you've been living and what you've been doing and who you are now yeah, we might talk yeah. about fundamental themes we all go through right and and that's and that's yeah. true but the specifics of how they manifest like the particulars you know yeah. it's obviously continuous with the life you're living and also where you're already aiming and that's and that's the well, it has to be that way for them to be useful and important. Otherwise, mm -hmm. it would be an, just some strange escape with no relevance to the world. But of course, it is deeply relevant mm -hmm. uh, to the world, but also something that, my word, uh, it requires a certain... Um, it's a certain kind of serious attitude. It's, yeah. not, it's, not, it's not as though you, yeah. there, there isn't still the lightness and fun and these different things, but these are powerful things. And, um, yeah. yeah. And, and also, though, there's, al there's so many different ways to help. I, I mean... People can, you know, pick something simple, and yeah. um, and that's doing good. That's moving things forward, and yeah. um, o over time, you see what's right for you. Or yeah, yeah. I, I have the uh, my um, son and daughter have both graduated college Beautiful. just uh, this last month. Oh, that's awesome! And so they're both in this like, you know, how do you choose what you do? Yeah, Jesus. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Please. Yeah, that question. The existential question. Damn, college is over. Hey. <laughs> Look, th at least at least the question, the question is good. The question is an important way. Oh, there. it's a the crucial one, yeah. Because but, but you can find it out. The answers you might not get in some blinding flash. You know, no. you might. Well, you it, might. I, I, suppose it, I suppose it could happen. And, and of course, inspiration strikes. If, if you're doing yeah, anything yeah. creative, there are lots of different little things you do and you take action on them and you do them. So the yeah. inspiration striking is something yeah. we can all relate to. However, the problem is mm. sometimes that life is so complicated mm. that, uh, you know, uh, you really have to step out there into the world and see what works and what doesn't before yeah. you can be totally sure. And so for anything complicated, it's, it's an effort that you obviously have to stick at for a long time. Yeah. And that's something yeah. obviously that you've been able to do so incredibly yeah. well, which is yeah. very, um, it's very impressive fundamentally. I've had the um, um, good fortune to see something change over. So in 1990 is when we first started working with the Veterans Administration to try to interest them in MDMA for mm -hmm. PTSD. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we kept being rejected and rejected and rejected. It was, um, it was at the San, Fr it, was, it was at a particular VA. Mm -hmm. um, and then just last year, um, we were, um, you know, our, our, our study is finally going to be um, conducted um, inside someone who's affiliated with the VA in a way, but who's um, head of a major department of psychiatry. And so he finally said yes to MDMA research, but it was the same one that said no in 1990. Mm. So it's, you know, 27 mm. years Jeez. to see somebody initially fearful and resistant yep. and I think the thing to say is that um, it doesn't seem that long you know that's not a really very long time it is no. a long time but it's like depends a, the frame of reference right yeah so. I think that you know if you can even see change in your own lifetime you're lucky you're just born at the right time and it's very fortunate in terms of trends and yeah, stuff but sure um, I think for people to choose it's like um yeah, I think you have long-term plans. I mean, you can have goals that are really long-term and and then you, you know, develop little um, efforts along the way to do pieces of that. Totally, so. totally. I have, a, I have a friend of mine, a wonderful man named Neville Christie, and he'll sometimes say, if you're going to Rome, sometimes you need to go through Naples. And when you're in Naples, you, meet, you realize you might need to go to Venice. <laughs> now, I have no geographic knowledge of Italy, so this could be f going all over the place. <laughs> right. Figuratively. Yeah. All right. And, and, uh, and, but, you know, 
the point is you can reassess yeah, along the way yeah. and and that's exactly as it as it should be and needs to be because yeah. you don't have all the knowledge yeah. at the beginning and yeah. and, and you don't have all the knowledge at the end but you hopefully yeah. have a little bit more um anyway but uh rick i know we don't have too long together yeah. um, thank you for sharing this time with me if, if i could ask yeah. you if i could ask you one question sure it would be go right ahead tim <laughs> let's think about it <laughs> Where are you aiming now? Europe. <laughs> Jesus, all right, we're already here, mate, okay? So you've already hit that target. What, are you going to burrow downwards, okay? Uh, You're right well, in the middle. We're in, Europe, in, like in the very next few days, um, we're, if not even potentially today, I haven't even checked, but um, probably tomorrow or Wednesday, we're going to receive a letter from the European Medicines Agency. Interesting. And it's going to include, this is the results of discussions that have uh, taken place over about six months so far. Mm-hmm. And it's going to include their um, scientific advice for what we need to do for phase three in order to make MDMA into a medicine. Then we need to develop a, um, a protocol and a budget. Mm-hmm. And then we need to raise um, probably $8 million, of which I think we have almost a million already. Mm-hmm. And then we need to train about uh, 40 therapists. And then next summer, 2019, I hope we start phase three in Europe. But that's a rapid timeline. And, um, and we will be starting phase three for FDA in August. Okay. So that's the organizational aim. Now, I suppose another question might be... Oh, okay. No, no, no. It's, it's, I, I'm, I'm interested in what's going on. Um, yeah. But also, I think it's always interesting to ask. I mean, you probably get asked this all a lot, so it's not particularly valuable, but it's, it's helpful to, to, to formulate where you're yeah, aiming. Well, you know? I, I like to be updating my thinking. It's always valuable. Well, it's, it's, uh, it is. It's, uh, it's, you have to figure out what the hell's going on. Jesus. But, okay, so your role in, in this is probably quite clear to you in certain respects Um, but in others i guess because things are so the world is so complicated and And dynamic and dynamic and the community psychedelic and otherwise is so large but just taking the psychedelic community it's small in some respects but large in terms of the different voices in there yeah yeah. even though there are definitely binding features there are different voices people are with different intentions quite different intentions for the world fundamentally if you were to just let them go off and paint it on some virtual reality page which which of course some people are trying to do um what what is it that that um what are the key features of the community or a way to discuss the current state of play and the value associated with the integration of psychedelics into our life and society. What are the fundamental features of how that discussion should happen that you Mm. believe Mm -hmm. absolutely need to be there and kept vital and alive or are still vital and alive? Well, I'd say respecting the fears and the questions of the other people that you're negotiating, discussing with, Mm. you know, the society, the culture, the FDA, the regulators, the EMA, that, that there's, they're coming from a place of wanting certain, um, there's certain kind of requirements. Some are rational, some are not that rational, some are, um, denial of reality. Some are really open. There's just a way in which, um, the first part is listening to what the uh, what they're saying mm. and trying to understand what their concerns are, which may be somewhat different than what they express them. Maybe they, they're not always expressing them. So it's to try to understand what their real goals are um, and then try to respond to those questions. So for us, it's been um, the progress we've made with the FDA has been from listening to the FDA and then trying to help them help us. So it's the thing I learned at the Kennedy School of government at Harvard uh, getting my master's and PhD was um, to think of myself, you know, as the, you know, chief of staff to the decision maker. Mm. You know, I mean, you can also Mm -hmm. think of yourself as the decision maker, but the idea is that you're trying to present the case um, as clear and simple as you can and then as weighted and balanced as that, um, and that, um, 
what I've seen over time is things go from one dose, you know, the, the consensus sort of, of um, science and was the one dose of MDMA caused serious neurotoxicity, which caused important functional consequences, which uh, meant that research should be either eliminated or, um, you know, struggled with over a long period of time. Mm. Two, a place where the risks are generally considered to be um, minimal from <laughs> and the, the benefits. So Absolutely. I've seen that um, transition, but it's from becoming um, the ally and helping people figure that out. I mean, I, I got... Um, I bought the first monkeys for George Riccardi to do um, studies because I wanted to know the answers. Um, when that wasn't enough, um, I got myself and friends to go get spinal taps. to They could look at our cerebral spinal fluid metabolites and try to prove to us how brain damaged we were. Yeah, so, no, incredible. I think yeah. there's, a, there's so much wisdom in there because it's fundamentally about recognizing that there's a shared yeah. image we all want to be yeah. a part of. Right, and so it's a bonding with what is fundamental between all individuals. It's, it's yeah. the humanity. It's what we have to go through. It's understanding that we all have, we all have goals, and and and, uh, and yeah, it's uh, it's a very valuable message. Well, uh, <laughs> thank you very much, mate. Cheers. <laughs>